Okay, so, okay, youth, let's lit the choir by first. That'd probably yeah. be a good idea. <laughs> okay, put your hand up for those who can help. So I'm going to wander. Hopefully, can everybody hear me okay? If not, I can talk louder, as you know. <laughs> good morning, Jeffrey. <laughs> I don't need a mic. <laughs> I don't either, but just in case I want to get all like emotional, I better have a microphone. So as I kind of shared with you, and you two can kind of sit and I'll stand behind you, I'm going to do the, the are you going to say that again? Yes. Okay. I'm going to do the best I can to let the youth um, do as much of this as possible. Chinari, will you move the mic kind of out into the front so that those who are speaking up, they can kind of have the mic if they want. You try to talk into the mic so that some of the folks in the back will be able to hear you for sure. <laughs> So the 30 hour famine, what was the 30 hour famine? A lot of you have kind of heard us talking about it, you've heard us building up upon it, but there was three primary components to this 30 hour famine. These 15 youth that you see sitting here participated along with over 100,000 other youth in the United States in World Hunger's 30 hour famine this weekend. Every one of these youth took an oath and they held through until 5 p.m. last night and they did not eat for 30 hours. We had a contingency plan in place. We were prepared that if at any point any of them melted down for one reason or the other, we had food. Let me tell you what that was. Oh there is a catch. <laughs> World Vision's emergency response team goes out into these areas where people haven't eaten for days. And they have two things that they call therapeutic superfoods. And the two primary foods that they teach the people to use and they provide the materials for is called, one's called CSB. And CSB stands for corn soy blend. What corn soy blend is, two cups of cornmeal, <laughs> one teaspoon of salt, a cup of flour, four cups of water, one third cup of vegetable oil, and one teaspoon of honey. Now that works really well in areas that have water. But as you know, a lot of these countries, the reason that they're in the situation they're in is because there is no water. The, the only water they have comes from rain. And if it's a drought season, they have no water. So the second alternative is they, pri they provide them with this thing called plumpy nut. And plumpy nut is four cups of peanut butter, a quarter cup of powdered sugar, four cups of powdered dry milk, and a tablespoon of vegetable oil. So Rebecca Felderman, thank you, Becca, um, she took these two recipes that World Vision gave us and she made both of these uh, items for us. And at any point that the youth got so hungry over the 30 hours that they needed to have something, they just couldn't handle it. Um, we had their two choices. They could choose to have CSB or they could have a plumpy nut. I can't, I can't remember that to save my life. So the condition was there's another catch. If you felt the need to go eat, you had to talk to a par find a partner, tell them I can't do it, and that other person had to agree to break their fast with you. So not only could you, your weakness take and say, I just can't do it. You had to convince another one of these folks to do it with you. And hopefully the peer pressure would, would help them drive and sustain through to kind of be strong. We did not have one kid break their fast until the United Methodist women fed us last night at five o'clock. So the question is, was that hard? Imagine, have you ever gone six hours without eating? 12 hours? 18 hours? 30 hours? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, I bulked up at about 11.30 Friday afternoon with a, a double cheeseburger and a big cheese fry and a large Coke because I did not think I was going to be able to do it. Not only did we do it, Ju Julius did it, Jennifer did it, Carla Marx did it. We all did it with the youth. Anybody else, uh, did anybody else choose to do it? Any other grown-ups that I didn't recognize? Because I know some of the grown-ups had talked about doing it. Um, but they, they did it. And so a big part of this whole 30-hour famine was to live through 30 hours of no food. What kind of emotions came from it? What kind of weaknesses? What kind of things in your guts told you, I can't do this? But in a second part of the learning about it because learning is the most important part. There's a three-phase part, learning, experience, and support. So all of the activities and games that we did had a learning component. We didn't just play soccer. 
we created our own soccer ball out of recycled materials, and we played it with a, a, a catch, and someone's going to talk about that. Here's the, one of the soccer balls we created. We experienced what it's like to live in poverty and hunger. We experienced through videos, through stories. The kit that we got from World Vision was amazing. And everything we did had an opportunity to learn about what was going on and to experience it. And then the last component of World Vision's program is the support. Everything that we did made us think about how we as individuals, either personally, as a family, as a church congregation, as a community, or as the United Methodist as a whole, how can we support the people that are forced to live this every day, not by us selective folks that just did it for 30 hours? And the support is, in some cases, $30 could feed the family for a week. I mean, there were videos that broke down. What was the one, guys, that dollar amount? A dollar a day. A dollar a day. 25 cents. 75 cents went to food. Yeah, 25. 25. Right, and out of that 75 cents in 2008, was it when the, when was the, where the, the economy, 2011, when the economy just went to dump, the 75 cents that they were able to use to feed a family for a day cut in half. And so all of a sudden, they not only were only living off of the 75 cents of, of rice and, and um, what was the other rice? It would feed a whole family of like of rice and bread. bread. Rice and bread. Like one loaf would be 75 or like one bag of rice, but then it doubled to 150. In 2011, they, if that's all they had budgeted, the cost doubled. And so they had a choice, find a way to get more money, which really wasn't a choice or an option. The second option was to learn how to live off of half of what you've been living off of already. So a, a lot of things like this in that the whole understanding and learning and living about it was trying to figure out strategies on how we can support them. So that's what the World Vision program was. Um, you know, Jules, I was thinking about, I want to show the video afterwards, I yeah, think. So I've created, so throughout the whole process, we took videos and we did some uh, photos. And so I created a, a little presentation, a five minute presentation to show you. But I want the youth to tell you about the program. I don't want this to just all be all about the leaders telling you about it. So we kind of have a strategy. Um, who's going to tell us about the tribes? I think that's our first thing, right? Alyssa. Alyssa. So Alyssa is from By uh, Byron. Go ahead, jump up there, Alyssa. Yeah, so Alyssa is one of our friends from Byron, and jump in there, Alyssa. You know, let's fix that. Julius, can you lower that? Yeah, it's too tall. There we go. So tell us about the tribes. What, 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 what are we wearing? What did we do? We had to, in the beginning, we had to put, be put into tribes, and then our tribes had to work together to compete in challenges. And we all had disabilities during the challenges. And we had bandanas for each tribe. Yeah. Tell us about the disabilities. Do you have your card? Um, Who's got their card? Here. Tell us about the individuals. And, and, and Each person got a card of who they're going to be. And that person has a disability. Like someone has no hearing, so they had to put earplugs in. Or some kids had to have 40-pound backpacks on. And yeah. Some couldn't yeah. see. We took a pair of sunglasses and blocked out one eye. So yeah. not only did they have to wear sunglasses, but they could only see out of one eye. Okay. Some couldn't talk. Some had to wear bandanas and weren't allowed to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Some had no hand usage. They were they had to wear mittens <laughs> for all the activities. <laughs> so every one of the youth throughout the activities had a disability of some sort. So that when we did these activities, not only did I twist them up so they were difficult activities to begin with, they all had some form of a disability to fight through as they did these activities. So that was the tribe system. The kids were broken up to tribes. Thank you, Alyssa. Great job. So our tribes were Kenya, Ethiopia, Mali, and Ghana. Uh, Kenya, I talked about Kenya. And so Everything that we did throughout the learning component of this, we talked about that region or that country. We talked about the individuals, as Alyssa was showing you. Each one of the kids were given that identity, and it talked about a child, their name, of one of the games, Know Your Name. Who wants to tell us about the Know Your Name activity? Go ahead. This is Cameron. This is Cameron from Byron. Hey, Cameron. Before Cameron starts, Cameron's holding a journal. One of the things that we did through the whole thing is every, every time we did an activity, every time we did something that was one of the learning or experience components, 
The kids got two minutes to write down their thoughts. There was a Bible verse. Maybe, I don't remember. Do you remember the Bible verse that went with yours? No. Does somebody remember the Bible verse that went with the Know Your Name? Every, every one of the activities had a Bible verse we read. We talked about how the Bible verse kind of fit into the activity. And um, they got to write their thoughts. And I, I told them that their thoughts are private. They don't have to share. There was a strict rule that you can't look at anybody else's journal. And hopefully a year from now, five years from now, they'll look back to these journals and think, Wow, that was pretty cool. And it'll have some of their interpersonal thoughts and feelings about their experience. So Cameron's holding her journal. I think that's going to help her remember some of the stuff she's going to talk about. With the Know Your Name Challenge, you had to keep it safe because we would tape our names on our back and we would try to find, like, we would try to look at other people's backs to put down their name on a piece of paper. And whoever, like, whatever tribe got the most, they would win like cardboard or tarp like with Kenya. <laughs> and what, do you remember why, what the important significance of the Know Your Name activity was? Does anybody remember that one? Go ahead, Jackie. Um, Stand up, please. The, well, you wanted to hide your identity, kind of. Yeah. Like, you don't want everyone to be, to. yeah. You wanted to keep it secret who you were, and it was kind of just for your own safety. Right, because in, in, in those countries, thank you, Cameron, very much. Let's give Cameron a hand. In some of these other countries, you had to hide. You had to hide who you were. You had to hide who you were attached to. Because in some cases, you became a target. Um, who you were associated to or where you lived became a reason that you would be um, in danger. So not only did they try to see each other's names, so it was a very fun you know, activity where you kind of had to not look at everybody else's name but without letting them see your back, so it was kind of crazy and fun. But um, it, the significance was in Africa, it's very difficult for these folks to keep their identity hidden and it's, they don't have the ability to share who they are. So, uh, so what was the next one? Who was next on camp the list? Football. Camp football. Who's gonna, John's going to talk to us about camp football. Yeah, Go ahead, John. Sam's going to come up too. Okay, John and Sam, hop up there. Tell us about camp football. Sounds like a fun activity, but what was the idea behind it? Go ahead, jump up there, guys. Who's first? Go ahead, John. Sure. This must be a written excerpt out of your journal. Go ahead. We played. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. We do have some true leaders in the group, as you can see. <laughs> Wait till we get to spiritual uh, gifts part. That, that one's exciting. We played a game of soccer, but had to use the crab walk instead of running to find out how hard it was to be hungry and exert yourself. It was hard. At first, after the game, we read from Luke. One of the verses said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Very good, John. Thank you. And Sam, what are you going to add to that? Can you scooch the mic pull down? There we go. A little more, Sam. There you go. Good. it. And we played with soccer balls that we made out of duct tape, string, and plastic bags, and newspaper. So we, tell us about the video. Why, why so, we watch the video? So they made a soccer ball and they just played soccer with it and you you wrap the you just crumble the paper um put it in the paper bag wrap the paper bag and you just wrap the string and this is the winning tribe soccer ball very good. Okay, so let me unpack that a little more for you. Thank you, Samuel. Feel free to pass the ball around. That ball was made out of recycled Walmart and you know, Food Max garbage bags, uh, newspaper. The only component that was really probably not readily accessible in Africa was the duct tape. Um, we did want to have an end product that we could actually play with. All four tribes made a soccer ball, but it was amazing to just kind of, if you take paper, you put it in a plastic bag and you twist it, it forces the air in there and it gives it some buoyancy inside and you wrap it a couple more times, these balls would literally bounce. It was super cool. And then they would use the, the um, in the video, the, it was intricate, the, the little African boy that showed us, I mean, 
it was so tight. It had all the little spots of a soccer ball. And then they just, it was like he was weaving it in and tying it. It was really, but he was using old fishing line and string. I mean, he didn't have some of the luxury components we had, but it, then, you know, 50 kids jumped in and played a soccer game out in this field. So it was amazing to see how they did it. And um, I'll turn that back on when we get back. Um, yes, ma'am. I'll bet some folks are wondering what crab soccer What is crab? Who wants to give me an example of the crab? Go ahead, Jackie, jump out there. Jackie's been a crab walk. We played, so we, we came up in the fellowship hall. We came up in the fellowship hall and we created two goals. And you'd think, okay, soccer with this, no problem. But they had to do it on all fours, upside down, and they could only use their feet. So it was not a simple game of soccer ball. It was crab walk soccer ball. And you can imagine, this occurred at about 11 p.m. on Friday night after the kids hadn't eaten for about 11 hours. So towards the end of the event, it was more butt drag crab walk because they just didn't quite have the energy to keep it on all fours. Um, but there again, yes, Aiden? And oh, Aiden, yeah. Aiden's disability was a 40. Yeah. Every activity that the kids are talking about, they had to use their, their disabilities for the activity. So for the different, you know, eight different activities that we did, some of them, you know, two had mittens on. Oh, just what was your guys' disability? Sam, what was your disability? Backpack. 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 Backpack.
And why is that significant? What was the guys? What was the significance of the, the scavenger hunt? Yeah. Let's see. Hey, what was the significance? You have to find stuff for your tribe to survive. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Janiri. Thanks, Janiri. So with that particular event, we talked about how when you leave your home, you have nothing. You have no ability to get a job. The only thing that you're going to have is to find you know garbage and debris and stuff to make your home. Okay. Or, or so that's kind of how that Market tied in. Mayhem. Market Mayhem was another one. In Market Mayhem, we had to, um, we had a water balloon that we had to make a structure for it, but we only had a limited amount of money to buy things to make the structure to c make sure it doesn't pop. <coughs> like we used duct tape, um, paper towels, newspaper, and cardboard to. And what was make the significance of the water balloon? That in Africa, that most of the people have to protect the resources they they have. That's right. To so other villagers are going to try to take your resources. Mm -hmm. or, or when they're walking through the busy markets, the last thing you want to do is thank you, Alyssa. Great job. The last thing you want to do is drop your vital resource. It's going to make the few dollars that you have. So we gave them all a micro loan. We talked about what a micro loan is. And so they were all given 30 American dollars, which equates to 500 burr in African burr. And so they were, here's, a, here's one of their $50 burr bills. They could start a small so business. they had two things that components that went with that. Not only did they, were they given this water balloon, which signified their precious cargo, their, the, the one thing that they had that they might be able to make enough money on to feed their family today. But um, the goal was is that if it was a tie and, and you were able to create this container that protected your water balloon, Whoever did it with the least amount of money spent. So we had a three-way tie in the end, and most of them only spent half of their money to create this. You, they could have built this fortress, right, and spent all $500, but one of the components was do it with the least amount of money and the least amount of resources so you could save your vital money. Okay, well. Hey, hey, you got food grab. This is our last challenge. So food grab is the last challenge that we did. So food grab was a challenge that eat. Uh, we were up in the fellowship hall and we had Julius had gone around and put down food in different spots and one member of each team had a blindfold on and they could not see at all and the other members of the team had to tell them which direction to go to try to find the food and each food represented a point value. It was rice was one point, water bottles were two and bananas were three points. Um, and there was three rounds and different kinds of food were everywhere and everyone had to pick up different foods. Um, the significance was kind of like in Africa they don't have enough food for everyone so everyone had to kind of find their own food and whoever had more food could survive longer and the tribe really had to work together to find the food. Excellent. Great job Gabe. So not only during this, during this event did we have the activities, I mean our strategy as the youth team was to create 30 hours of stuff for them to do so they never thought about being hungry. Um, and you know, to share with you, you know, our goal was to be done around midnight, 1 a.m. And finally at 2.45 when they're playing the Wii dance and Jackie beat everybody about 24 except times, Aiden except for Aiden, about 2.45. Okay, you will see a photo of Diva Chu in the presentation, so watch for that. By 2.45 a.m. after they hadn't eaten for about 14, 16 hours, we forced them to bed. Now, some of the girls were a little bit more smart, and they were in bed between 12 and 1, but some of them were barely in bed by 3 a.m. We got them all up at 8 a.m., regardless of the time they went to bed, so some of them functioned in that... 20 to 30 hour window of no eating time on only four or five hours sleep. So not only did you have the famine component, you also had the fatigue component. So um, a big part of the present thing that we did as well was we had some really special presentations. So Chu is going to tell us about one of them. So. <laughs> All right. So we had a bunch of guest speakers come up. The first was Carla. She, she gave us a presentation about diabetes. Uh, we learned a lot about type 1 diabetes that we didn't know before. We, everyone was pretty much into it because after a couple hours with no food, uh, people who could have got grumpy, but we all paid attention. We were all so invested in it. It was a pretty interesting presentation. We learned, because type, type 1 diabetes is where the body cannot produce insulin. 
So we learned all the different ways that diabetics could uh, infuse insulin into their body through either needles, well, they all had a needle, but through like little machines, uh, a needle, you could take a needle. We learned how much, how many times they have to take insulin in a day, which pretty much after every meal. Um, we learned, I mean, it was a pretty fascinating experiment, experience because I thought I knew a lot about diabetes and I learned a lot that I didn't know before. Uh, everyone had questions. I, I really enjoyed it, and I think everyone in the group really enjoyed it. We were great. We learned uh, etiquette with diabetics. You just have to ex accept it. Don't try. Just be respectful because this is something they have to live through, but they could live perfectly normal lives. They could go on and do great things. It's not a hindrance to what they can do in life. And, Thank you, she's very good. And I'd like to make a special thank you to Carla Marks. Carla, what was that? Oh, no, sorry. Carla had some great props. She brought in an insulin pump and she brought in a lot of the needles and syringes and yeah. the different apparatuses that can be used. And, you know, here I thought, okay, five minutes of this, the kids are wiped out, tired, and starving. The last thing I want to do is they were riveted. It was just amazing how interested they were just, just to kind of embrace something that they probably had no clue about. Yes, ma'am. We did have a type 1 diabetic participate. And um, you know, throughout the process, uh, he was very conscious of you know, checking his, his, um, his, what is it? So what's the blood proper term? His, his blood sugar testing, right? And there were certain accommodations, but he participated very well in the best that he could in order to stay healthy and safe. So uh, you know, it had a personal component to it. And we shared that within the group. And you know, I don't want to front the individual for those that don't know. That's his business. But, um, it, it, was, it was a very personal component that went with it too. One of the conditions to participate in 30 hour famine is they ask that the children be at least 12 years old. For safety reasons, they, they want them at least 12 and there's a lot of warnings and cautions you know, for any kid under 12 to not eat for 30 hours. There's some, some safety factors. So in this case, um, the reason that it was targeting the older youth was because 12 years old was the minimum age that was recommended. A couple of kids right on that edge participated, but their parents were aware and they were watched a little bit more carefully. You know, 30 hours of no food, no sugar. They did get to drink juice and water as needed, but they, had, they only had four juice sessions in 30 hours. And then they were able to drink water, but we even controlled the water intake. We didn't want them to overfill with water and have other medical relation, re issues related to just the over you know, abundance of water and start drowning out or having um, you know, too much water intake. So Sarah's going to tell us about the next one. So while we weren't eating for as long as we, like 20, 30 hours, um, one of the presentations we had was from Joanne Funk. And she showed us um, juicer. She used a juicer and she put a bunch of different food in it. And so this is kind of like our dinner, liquid dinner. And it filled me up because I drank it. And it showed you that from what food you have and how little food you have, you can put it all together and make just one thing that you can actually drink. And so the first one was red juice and I had carrots and celery, celery and beets. Beets. Yeah. Now, beets and carrots. That one. This was not my favorite part of the experience, uh, let me tell you. I drank, I drank that one really fast. And the second one was green juice, which is Dr. Oz's green juice. And it was pretty good. It had spinach, cucumbers, apples, bananas, lemon juice, parsley, ginger. And that one was really, I liked it, but it was, it was good. So, as far as yeah. being, thank you, Sarah. As far as being a green thing, as most of you know, I didn't get this figure from eating a lot of vegetables. Um, but I will tell you, after not eating for all, nearly 12 hours, that Dr. Oz's green juice was pretty darn good. <laughs> I closed my eyes and was pretending that it was not spinach. Please don't let this be spinach. It was a wonderful juice. So, Joanne, thank you very much for taking the time and providing the materials to give us a, a juice experience. So now Aiden's going to tell us about the next one. What? What were you saying? Did I miss something? Okay. Um, before the 30-hour famine, we had an 80-question survey that we all had to fill out. It was long. 
Um, <laughs> I think the 80, 80 question survey was more torture than the not eating for 30 hours, huh? It, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it was, it told us what our spiritual gifts were, which were like what we were good at, what God gave us to be good at. And um, we each got a little plaque saying, listing all of the spiritual gifts and how much in each section that we got. This is Samuel Samuel's one. And um, what's Sam's spiritual gift? Discernment. Discernment. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and pastor and mercy. <laughs> One of the ones that was a big any surprise. Guys, any surprises? I know we actually asked the youth to guess oh, what God. their top one was, and we got up to Mr. Murphy Slay, and Murphy, you said what your least one was? Was pastor. pastor. And his biggest spiritual gift was, was pastor. pastor. <laughs> so someday when Murphy Slay is up here giving the sermon, if you're still alive to uh, experience that, um, whew, that'll be interesting. <laughs> So we can pass that around. Thank you, Aiden. I know some of you are probably anxious to get out of here. We're almost done. Um, Annie's going to tell us about the next one. So Mel Strong came down in the morning and told us uh, about this presentation, Find a Need and Fill It, basically just reminding us that through life, you know, there should never really be a moment when you're bored. There are so many needs out there that you could be putting your energy towards, whether they be personal, like cleaning your room, or helping your parent with something, or even going up to the new kid at school and you know introducing yourself, making them uh, friends with them. So I just want to share the passage that he uh, read to us because it was also a passage linked to, I think it was our border crossing activity. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to shorten it for the sake of time, but anyway. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in or needed clothing and clothed you? When did we seek you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whenever you did for, oh, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me. So I think just as a youth that was really important <coughs> to Remind us, you know, as a kid, oftentimes you feel like you can't make an impact on your community. You don't have an income. You can't be making big donations to charity and whatnot. But um, it actually reminded me of an activity I did with Joanne when I was going through confirmation. And she gave me a homework assignment to just go and smile at people. You will be amazed what kind of reactions you'll get. You know, someone could be having a terrible day, and then they see that smile from you, and it, suddenly everything's better. So I think I just want to offer that up as an idea for everybody maybe this week. Try to find that one person you know that may need a smile, and you might be surprised by the reaction you get. As you're hearing through, this, uh, through some of the youth's experiences, you can imagine what a powerful event this was for them and for us, too. Okay, Murphy's got the last one really quick. Oh, that was a little too I don't think I really need it. So... We did, um, what was it, three? Three community service projects. Some, um, like six people went to Mel's house, uh, Vernon's house. And then um, me and a couple of my friends helped in the Good News Garden. And then we, some people also went to the kitchen. And so that was really like, that kind of, What's the word I'm looking for? What did you do in the kitchen? What did you guys do in the kitchen? You guys can see the physical work in the kitchen. Jay Marks led that. So Jay Marks know. came in. in I, I will help. Thank you, Murphy, for yours. Are you done? There we go. Okay. Do you have a chance? We, Jay Marks came in and led a, led a group of the kids to a deep cleaning of the kitchen. They scrubbed the floors. They scrubbed the, all of the um, appliances in there. They, they cleaned up all of the sinks and countertops. It, you know, a lot of times the, that kitchen gets used and it just, the surface gets wiped. They came in and did a deep cleaning sanitizing of the entire kitchen yesterday. The second thing is some of you have already noticed coming in today, the Good News Garden got a facelift. Deborah uh, Urzua came in and led a team of kids. They whacked down all the weeds. They put all that garbage away. The Good News Garden got a, a, a facelift. And then a group of the kids went out to the um, community. They actually went out to Vernon's house. And Vernon was, was sharing with me this morning. They cleaned windows. They vacuumed out the garage. They, they did a bunch of stuff at your house, right, Vernon? Yeah. So
so it was a very good component for the kids to get out and interact with our, our congregational care you know, uh, network of, of stuff. And I'm hoping that as the CCN starts you know, just thriving, you know, our youth will be able to be more involved in, in reaching out to some of the, the, our congregation in need. So, okay, so Jackie, Jackie's going to talk about the t-shirt. And, and the villages, yeah. Okay, you're going to add to it. So, first of all, I'm going to start with the forts because we started that first. We, as you, we've kind of already explained, we earned everything for our fort. We only had a few boxes of cardboard to start off with at, per tribe, but we had to earn the tarps, the duct tape, the rope, the extra cardboard, and anything else we needed for it, and everyone eventually got a church too, because why not have a church? <laughs> but it was hard. You had to have a strategy to build it, to have a roof over your head, to something that would keep you, well, something you can live in. Like, this really probably is the best one. Probably to all of us. Yeah. The four of us went in earlier. We only fit in one room, and there's like three rooms. So, yeah. In the backyard. So go ahead and tell us about the T-shirts. Turn around, show in the back of your shirt. Yeah. yeah. At the back of my t-shirt, I try to use handprints to make angel wings because I felt like we were kind of, in a way, helping out because we were experiencing what other people did. And so we're just learning what they have to give through and go through. And so everyone had their own personal design. We put in our tribe. So now we actually wanted to be identified for our tribe, whereas we were trying to hide it earlier. So... Thank you very much, Jackie. So now last night, in order for the, for, the, for the youth, we broke the fast last night at 5 o'clock. And thank you very much to the, the UMW, the women. I'm going to move away from that mic so I don't get feedback. The, the United Methodist women came in and provided a huge feast. And um, it was awesome at 5 o'clock after the 30-hour window had expired. Uh, we, we broke the fast, and we had family members come, and some of the congregation come, and they got to eat. Thank you very much to the UMW for providing that food. Kids, let's give them a hand. Um, in order to get their meal, and in order for the family members to get a meal, they had to, get a tic they had to provide a ticket. And the ticket was something that they wrote from their heart um, about famine or about you know, poverty or about the, the, the program. So Chu's going to share a couple of the tickets that were collected for the meals last night. Mic up, Chu. Yeah. Almost done, I promise, for those of you that are looking at your watches. Okay. Well, here are some of the tickets. This is my first time, and I loved it. I want to come all the time. My reflection made me realize what other people go through. Also, I say I learned that I need to start thanking you start thank youing in my for life. I learned that even if you might not have the most things in luxury, you can still be happy whether it's doing things we love, being with our families, or just being able to talk to God, with God. It really opened my heart and made me realize how lucky we are to live how we live. <laughs> this experience helped me realize how good we have it, and we should be thankful for everything we have. I felt how others struggle to survive, not knowing when their next meal is. I also felt closer to God because I rely on him for strength. Going through this event has made me realize just how lucky I am. The feeling of great hunger humbled me. If I wasn't grateful for three square meals, I certainly am now. I wish to offer my prayers to the hungry children and families around the world. I pray with all my heart that God may bless their lives, giving them the hope to thrive and survive. So that is, that is kind of the testimonials of some of these 12 to 16, 17-year-old youth that participated in the event. You know, it was fun. It was uh, painful at times. Uh, but it, it was spiritual. It was spiritual at many different levels. And you know, when we look at, back at the hard work that myself, Julius, and Carla, and Jennifer uh, as the team leaders of this event, and then Pastor Alexis, and Joanne, and Carla, and Mel, everybody that came in and 
and was a part of the, the, um, the presenters, the impact that it had. As we dig deep at times where we reach out to you as the congregation for money to support these youth activities, as we look to you to support helping um, work and participate in these things, recognize the work that's going involved in, mold in molding the life of our future, a future of our church, a future of our community. And so as a great thank you to all of the congregation for helping support our youth activities. For those of you that have given money, um, I know that a part of this program is the support. A, a pre part of this program was to do fundraising efforts, but because of the timing that didn't work out, we did raise a little bit of money last night. You've been providing for our youth program, so we're not gonna reach out too hard for you in this particular case. But I just want you to see the, the reward of the experience and the spirituality that the youth got out of this. So thank you for everybody involved. As we reflect quietly, I'd like to show you a video. We took photos and video throughout the thing. It's only five minutes. Um, I apologize for the lateness, but you know me, I'd, I'd like to talk. Do we have time, Pastor, for the video? Yes.